Question? Um, so let me start off with the first, one of the first issues that's raised, and maybe I'll start with Bruce Power first, uh, where the <coughs> intervener uh, states that the stations have become more dangerous than uh, a, a year ago, and the risk assessments show that the, the the likelihood of large accident radiation release has gone up by almost a decade. Uh, and I know on the first day you, you folks had made some comments on that. So maybe if we can turn to slide number two from this morning, and if you can talk about what's changed from 2003 to 2014 for Bruce A and 1999 to 2014 for Bruce B that's resulted in uh, a higher likelihood of a large release. Yeah, so Frank Saunders, for the record, um, I'll, I'll provide a little general background first, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague here, Mr. Newman, with the uh, detailed engineering review. I suspect you wouldn't be surprised to find out that we don't agree with Mr. Stencil's uh, analysis here. Um, however, uh, general background uh, in terms of looking at the new approach to PSA that, that, that we've adapted over the last few years, uh, through the CNSC, uh, the way we did this was by a methodology that was uh, reviewed and approved by the CNSC before we started. It was certainly a very major undertaking. There were 47 external events that needed to be considered be in, in the process of doing this. Now, some of them were volcanoes and the like, which we were able to screen out fairly quickly as not necessarily being applicable here. But this was a, a very major uh, chunk of work. Uh, at the same time, we had the Fukushima response going on, and I've heard in a number of the interventions this notion that this is all paper, that in fact uh, real things didn't happen, and that's not actually true. Um, we have installed a lot of equipment in the plant. Uh, in fact, uh, we're the envy of most nuclear plants in terms of what we've been able to install and to make work in the short period of time since Fukushima. A three-year period to do these kind of uh, modifications in a nuclear plant is, uh, is really a challenge because of the, the, the quality control and the quality assurance uh, programs that we need to go through. Uh, but we did the work and we met the commitments that we had said to CNSC. Uh, we do sometimes argue with CNSC staff about what exactly some of those commitments were and what they weren't, and so it's not too surprising that some of that arguing was going on. But we did meet the commitments, sent the thing, and, and even today we continue to improve uh, the PSA and we made a number of commitments uh, based on our work in the PSA to make some improvements, further improvements in the plant, even beyond what Fukushima had noted, uh, to further enhance the PSA. So far from being all paper, it actually is, for the most part, a large uh, change in plan, change in philosophy, the addition of a whole new uh, safety approach, uh, and the detailed work in the PSA was helpful. Uh, I, I certainly like uh, Mr. Stencil's uh, suggestion that we should self-regulate, I'd, I'd, I'd love to go there, but uh, there's, there's, there's not much evidence in my mind that that's happening today. Uh, if, the, if there is, I'm really missing it. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Uh, Newman and uh, let him do some of the detailed discussion here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for the record, uh, Gary Newman. Um, so as Mr. Saunders already indicated, uh, we've followed um, best practice protocols. We also uh, engaged with some key engineering uh, resources out of the U.S. Uh, Aaron Engineering was one of those, as long with our domestic. These folks are considered to be experts by the U.S. NRC, in fact, engage with them on a, on a quite frequent basis. Why did we go to them? Well, because we wanted to go to the industry best when we did our work. So in terms of answering Part B of your question, which is what has changed, I, I would say that uh, our evaluation of the external aspect of the uh, PRA was much more extensive. And so it may appear that there's been a change, but as Mr. Saunders described, we, we had to review on the order, and I got 47 on my screen here, uh, volcanoes we did not evaluate. We, we did screen that out, but we have to evaluate a very long list of items uh, and included, which wasn't done back in the earlier uh, PRAs that were submitted. They had external events, but not to this degree. So the plant really hasn't degraded in terms of its uh, risk. The risk has not increased. We've gotten much better at uh, identifying and quantifying an accurate portrayal of what the risk is. I think we're mixing two things here. As I stated in my presentation, the comparison that I made in my submission was including only internal events. Uh, the, the PRAs that were produced in the 
late 1990s and early 2000s before 2005 didn't include external events. So to make an apples to apples comparison, that's what I provided you. Um, and where I've seen, so that is where we've seen the actual increase that tells me we've learned something about the design and the risk profile of the station over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, and that's where I've also seen and indicated in my presentation where we've seen the most analytical enhancements. It's around these containment bypass accidents that are the dominant contributors to risk. Those accidents used to have frequencies in the 1E to the 9 in the 1990s, and now they're up into the 1E to the 6. So why that is, what I would put to you today is I've also reviewed, you see a similar phenomena with the Pickering reactors, where when you compare their current results just for internal events against the results from the 1990s, you also see a huge increase uh, into the realm of the credible for large release accidents and as well early release accidents. I'm not an engineer, as you all know, but what it tells me is we're learning about, or not learning, we've observed some weaknesses in the c containment for the candy reactors. Um, the, these, especially the Bruce A design, uh, that was designed in the 1970s, or the 1960s. So it has a very old design, and we need to remember that the, the Ontario Candus share containment. So they have less redundancy uh, than other facilities in Quebec or New Brunswick, for example. So that may explain, I'm speculating again, uh, why this large release frequency has gone up so much. What I think would be useful to do, even outside of these hearings, is it would be useful for the Commission to have a discussion about what have we learned from all the plants. We've been doing these PRAs now for 30 years. When we compare them from the 90s to the current date for external events, we can learn about new vulnerabilities that we become aware of. Um, I mentioned this to some, some staff uh, last year uh, because I had done a comparison for the SARP, my SARP comments of all the PSA results. And I was like, these are results today are very different than 10 years ago for all the stations. Have you done a comparison? Like the results are very different. And the staff member said, you're, you're right, the results are very different, but we haven't done that assessment. I've seen in access to information documents from 10 years ago, staff would often talk about comparing uh, the PSA results from different stations and in the past. I think that would be a good endeavor outside of this hearing to look into why this is happening. But I think my initial point still stands. When you compare on an apples to apples basis, the risk or the estimated or understood risk for large release frequency has increased significantly. And that's my concern. Yeah, sorry, Frank Saunders, for the record, just to clarify some points here. Uh, on the internal event, uh, we're not actually comparing apples to apples, right? So in 1999, a large release was considered to be 1% of the cesium in the core. Uh, nowadays, a large release is defined as five times its 10 to the 14 becquerels, which is about five times less than that. So in 1999, when you calculated a large release, there were a whole bunch of sequences that weren't even in there that are in today. And that's been a progression towards uh, more safety and more concern for offsite uh, planning and control, a move in the right direction. But when you, so when you're looking at 1999, 2000 numbers and today, they were different calculations on different release frequencies. The other thing Mr. Stencil did was conveniently leave out the portion with EME in there. I know he says you shouldn't include it, but in our view it's a significant safety improvement and it should be included. Uh, we spent a lot of time and effort calculating that. Uh, we used a very conservative uh, application of EME. For example, we didn't include EME in large earthquake scenarios. We didn't include them in high wind scenarios that, that uh, trucks wouldn't have been operable in. Uh, and we assumed that it would be a 10% failure rate on an EME on a normal basis at any rate, which is for sure very conservative, and that's because we're still working on the models with EME to, to do that. Those failure rates will be much less than that in real life because we know they are. Um, so uh, it, even on that very conservative basis, uh, if you look at the numbers uh, and look at our number, you'll see that actually the risk is 10 times lower than it was in 1999, not 10 times higher. So uh, we can debate all these different ways of adding the numbers and putting them together. Uh, like I say, the, yesterday we said this was 40,000 pages of analysis and documents. 
but in truth is we followed the process that was agreed with CNSC. We did the work that way. We used external experts to do the work. The numbers are what they are. Uh, and, and in reality, they show that the addition of the emergency mitigating equipment, a lot of enhancements that have made in the plant, uh, other than that, uh, have made a significant difference not to decrease frequency, but to actually improve uh, safety overall. I'd like, I'd like to bring the regulator perspective into this, uh, staff. Yeah, Barclay Housen speaking. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Jamal to provide a response. I think the key thing is we look at a very whole safety case, which we've talked about over the past couple of days. And from the staff perspective, um, we're extremely diligent in completing our work, but we're also open-minded to other opinions. But we really do focus on international practices, and in some cases we are leading in these areas. So I'll pass to Mr. Jamal to talk about our approach. In terms of for the record, I'd just uh, uh, like to tell the Commission it's uh, I personally have a lot of respect for Mr. Tsenso, so I'm going to focus on the issue, so don't take my comments personally. Uh, one thing I would like to correct on the record, Mr. Stenso repeated periodically that the uh, can-do reactor have a single containment and there is no redundancy. For the record, each reactor in the can-do design has its own containment. As part of redundancy of the, in addition to the two independent uh, shutdown system, there is the vacuum building as an added redundancy in case of to protect the containment as part of defense in depth mechanism. And that is within the safety case. So I would like to fix and, and on the record clarify the fact that there, are, there is redundancy in place and containment for each and every reactor is in place. On the PSA itself, as you heard the discussion, this is a number crunching process that is in order to determine the elements that uh, the operators and the enhancement the operator will take and put in place in order to determine are we getting the highest return with respect to the physical enhancement that's taking place. So the PSA is a tool, it's a tool to support and complement the safety case. It's not an indication of a danger or a risk. So it's not the single tool that is being used to determine if the facility or the stations are presenting a risk. Go back to the fact that the PSA is, is determining is the operator putting in place the proper physical enhancement the methodology associated with the PSA itself is based on international practices. And in addition to the existing PSA of an existing reactor, as the operator proposed enhancement, let it be for a complete refurbishment or enhancement on the ongoing basis. And the enhancement I would like to speak about here is the CNSC action plan associated with the Fukushima action plan. Those, the operators had no options but to implement the safety enhancement in place. And as part of the ongoing enhancement, they should be credited with respect to the PSA methodology in order to determine uh, what is the added safety enhancement associated with the EMEs or the emergency mitigation equipment that we imposed on the licensees to put in place. I will pass it on now to Mr. Jerry Frappier in order to talk about the table presented by uh, uh, Greenpeace and the way forward with respect to the PSA. Jerry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jamel. Um, my name is Jerry Frappier. For the record, I'm the Director General of Assessment and Analysis uh, and the person responsible for ensuring the requirements are state of the art and that uh, uh, industry uh, is abiding by them. Certainly. We do not have self-regulation when it comes to uh, PSA, as, uh, as indicated. <clears throat> in fact, that we are one of the leaders in the world in the requirements that we put on our licensees, and I'll get to that in one second. But first, regarding the table that's on, uh, on slide two, uh, I'd like to, for the record, indicate that I believe it's very misleading. Uh, it's really comparing apples and oranges, as uh, somebody else stated earlier. The, uh, the current, uh, and, and that's because of us, if you like, the regulator, where we have changed some of the rules and some of the, uh, the uh, uh, ways to which to, to calculate things. First of all, and most importantly, the release categories are different now than they were in the past. 
So today they are more restrictive, uh, and so we consider many more releases as large releases, which in the past would not have been considered as large releases. So, of course, if you increase the number of events that are going to go into that bucket, uh, the, uh, the frequency uh, will, will, will also go up. And, and that's a, a short, quick explanation. We can go into a lot more detail, but that's the explanation for, for the numbers shown there. I also think it's misleading because it does not include the uh, uh, improvements that have been made uh, recently, which uh, uh, both EME and other improvements that are, that are made at the plant, which will uh, also reduce the, um, uh, the, the numbers or the, or the uh, assigned risk. But uh, more importantly in this whole discussion on PSA, I believe, is the, uh, the Commission's philosophy of continuous improvement. Uh, and that applies to uh, PSA as well. And so both the methodologies and what we require industry to do. The licenses were amended to require uh, PSAs to meet S-294. In the past, uh, for some of the numbers you're looking at there, the, two th the 99s and the 2005, we did not have an agreed-upon standard uh, by which we wanted the PSAs done. So that was, that was put in place, put into the licenses, and brought a lot more systematic and, 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 and uh, uh, more rigid approach to, uh, to how uh, the hazards were calculated or, or the risks were calculated. And most importantly, uh, uh, improvement with respect to the requirement for external hazards to be included. They're not in this table, I agree. Uh, but in general, the PSA uh, is a more robust and systematic set of methodologies than it was in the, in the, in the past. But I can assure you that if you take apart all these numbers and look at the plants themselves, the uh, overall risk has in fact improved because of the improvements not just in the, uh, the analytical approaches, although analytical approaches are important, they do represent reality, but, uh, uh, but also the, uh, the design improvements that have been made. We talk a lot about the uh, EME, the emergency mitigating equipment, but there are other design changes that were also made. Uh, and, uh, and those were, uh, uh, have reduced the risk uh, uh, significantly. Canada is currently a world leader in the requirements placed on industry with respect to PSA. It's one of the few countries in the world that requires all nuclear power plants to have a complete level one and level two analysis done including both internal and external events such as seismic wind and flooding. So there is no self-regulation here with respect to those, uh, that approach. This is driven by uh, the Commission. And it's a good news story of continuous improvement. And as industry analyzes their plants in more, uh, more in different ways, including PSAs, uh, safety improvement opportunities are identified uh, and implemented. And this is one of the reasons Canadian industry was able to respond so quickly uh, to the, uh, the, the results coming out of Fukushima because a lot of the analysis had already been done. So the key role of the PSA, as I think uh, Mr. Stencil mentioned as well, is to, uh, may, to identify the main contributors to risk and therefore lead to some discussions, some engineering reviews as to how they can be improved, and those become safety improvement uh, opportunities. Finally, I'd just like to mention that, uh, uh, um, again, to, to clarify and to, and to be clear for the record, the, uh, the Greenpeace presentation uh, uh, indicates that there's contraventions to, to requirements, uh, both international and Canadian guidelines, and I want to say categorically that's not true. Uh, you can look at all of these numbers and you'll find that the, uh, the, uh, the 10 to the minus 5 has been respected uh, as the, uh, the limit that is, uh, is placed. Uh, that is the international uh, guideline as well for, for, uh, for current operating plants. Uh, and uh, both on this occasion and I'm sure as we move forward in the, in the rest of our debates, uh, we can talk a lot about what's happening down at 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, these sort of things, but let's remember that the limit is really at 10 to the minus 5, and we are certainly well within that. Okay, okay, Ms. Yoshi. So uh, I want to thank Bruce Power and staff. Uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion. I will start it just with slide 2, and, I'm, uh, and, and so you don't have to get all your arguments in. In responding to that, it was really... Are we looking at the same thing when we're looking at uh, two periods of time? 
And uh, is it apples to apples comparison? Uh, are the plants uh, less safe? And so what I've heard from both is uh, the definition of large release has changed. We're including a whole lot more uh, event categories in there. And uh, so if we really were to compare the same thing, it would actually be lower today. Forget the EME effectiveness. But I'm sure we'll have a lot more there. But there have been other safety improvements that have happened. So is it, is it accurate to state that if you were truly comparing apples to apples, that the plants in 2014, not including EMEs, would have a lower uh, radiation, large radiation release frequency if it was defined the same way. Jerry Frappi, for the record. So we haven't uh, done that sort of number calculation, if you like. Uh, the reason is it's, it's not just because we don't want to do it. It's actually a bit more complicated than it, than it might sound because as we've shifted the uh, release uh, categories, uh, um, some of the things that were in one category are now in another, so to actually pull the PSA apart to get back down to that level would, uh, would uh, be work, and I'm not sure it would mean anything at the end of the day because we do have to look at the plant as it is today, not as some, you know, minus certain things. Fair enough. I think it was getting more to Mr. Stencil's comment, what have we learned in doing these PSAs? And if you took a step back and said, plants are actually safer, we've done a whole lot of good stuff here, we've got better at our analysis, we've got more information, is it safe to say that? Is it accurate to say that? So, uh, Ken Lafner, for the record, I'd like to add um, that um, Point Pro went through a refurbishment project and they did, as part of that project, they did a PSA. So in responding to the Fukushima enhancement, we discovered that Point Pro had essentially addressed through the PSA several of the mechanisms that were required for the Fukushima enhancement, and I can name moderator makeup, uh, the EFADs, and, and so on. So these are the enhancements that Bruce Power have put in place also. So yes, we have learned the plants are safer categorically. Mr. Stancil, over to you. Have you been convinced, compelled argument presented? I'm not sure where to start. Um, first of all, from, I think from a, the point made about the threshold on what is a large release, that is a fair point. Um, but to quibble from a public intervener's perspective, the way the, one -E, the large release has been portrayed in the past and now is that's the level at which social, di social dislocation would take place at uh, in terms of larger accidents. Um, that bar may have shifted slightly, but from a public intervener's perspective, that's what we're told. This, those types of accidents are below this limit. So maybe it's gone down, but also within that, and I talk about this in my submission, um, other uh, thresholds have changed. Uh, in the 1990s, for example, uh, Bruce Power, uh, the Bruce reactors calculated a severe release frequency. And um, that was about a third of the overall large release frequency. That is buried within these numbers as well. We can't see it anymore, uh, but there are larger releases within that that we can't see without asking for more information. So a lot of this is how things are binned. Um, so on the first point, that may have changed, but there's other uh, denominators within that. But from a public perspective, it's about large-scale dislo large dislocation. The second piece is on EME. We're going to keep coming back to this. The point I made in my submission was that it took us a decade to include external events within PSA, and it's still highly controversial on how it's aggregated, how you do uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. However, for EME, we've managed to integrate it within the PRAs, PSAs, within about two years. Um, I've seen no real qualification of like how robust is that, but it leads to skepticism about why that was so rushed to include it. I speculate it's because the numbers are coming out where they are. Uh, if the results were the same as at 1E to the 7 um, from the 1990s, there would be no need for regulatory action, would there? Um, I would also point out here that the lines or the messaging lines we're hearing from both staff and Bruce Power or mostly from staff, are very different from what we heard at the Pickering hearings. Uh, at the Pickering hearings, I used a, a very similar graph, trying to compare apples to apples. This threshold issue was not brought up. 
Um, I think the takeaway message that I'm saying is the overall large release frequency, whether the threshold is a little below or a little not, it's the amount of cesium in the core. Um, overall, I think that stands. I haven't heard anything to refute that. Um, in regard to PSA as an indicator, which is also a new line, uh, it's not a hard and fast limit we should be using. Um, I would note here that when Ontario developed its offsite nuclear emergency plans, it relied on the Pickering A risk assessment in the 1990s, which showed there was a very low risk or likelihood of large and early releases. And that determined the offsite protective measures. So we do need to take these numbers seriously if we are to be consistent. And what I've seen again at the Pickering hearings and at these hearings is that the large release frequency has gone up and there is a tendency t towards large early releases. And on that one, I would um, just clarify my point in my submission was for new reactors uh, in both RD337, it says large releases should not take place before 24 hours or evacuation procedures can take place. So that point stands. And the European Union released a safety directive last year in light of Fukushima saying that large early releases should be avoided for existing reactors uh, so that emergency planning can take place. So this is a real factor that we need to consider given that the, the initial findings were that large early releases can take place. That contravenes the assumptions in the off-site plans and what we see in other international precedent, precedent and also for new reactors. And when we look at refurbishing reactors, yes, the limit for existing reactors is 1e to the 5. We're looking at 1e to the 6 in RD337. So I believe that's still in scope for consideration for a modern station. Um, question? Anybody else? to jump in now. Uh, first of all, uh, on the European, I remember there was a diplomatic meeting on all of this. What was the actual outcome of the European? Mr. Jamal, for the record, uh, Mr. Stensel is making reference to the European Directive and the Convention on Nuclear Safety, and in specific the diplomatic conference that addressed the, the fact of, uh, I won't call it large release in, in, uh, in such uh, number, was but it was uh, addressed with respect to the emergency preparedness and the existing reactors so that there will be uh, lowest impact with respect to the environmental impact from an accident uh, from a nuclear power plant. So in other words, uh, looking at the long term where the impact will be lessened as, practic as, pra as low as practic practicable for the existing facility. And as we speak today, if we're going to go back to the numbers, the limit is 10 to the minus 5. And Mr. Stencil is correct. In our uh, regulatory document for a new build, is 10 to the minus 6. However, the limit is 10 to the minus 5. The continuous enhancement and improvement that Bruce Power will have to put in place, that's what they are uh, working towards as a target the equivalency to 10 to the minus 6 in the future. So we are not static with respect to the, our requirement. They meet the existing limit. They are in compliance with S-294. The target, uh, as a target, as a continuous enhancement, they will work towards 10 to the minus 6 by which they will achieve that number. But I've got to remind everybody, this is a number crunching element against a physical enhancement to take place. So this is just one of the indicators and it's not the only indicator with respect to the safety. Mr. Stencil mentions with respect to the uh, large reach frequency, where is it right now? As the methodology of PSA has changed over the time, that is included and in your submission, Mr. Stencil, in table number two, if you look at the uh, rule, um, release category three, it involves uh, in RD152, large release mixture of fission products greater than 10 to the 14 for season 137. So that is already included in the PSA as part of the enhanced methodology. I will pass it on to Mr. Frappier to be specific with the progression of enhancement for PSA methodology. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jamal. Um, Jerry Frappier, for the record. 
so as we talk about uh, large releases and, uh, and 10 to the minus 5 versus 10 to the minus 6, as, as Mr. Jamel has said, our, this is, again, a good news story of continuous improvement that the regulator is uh, requiring industry to show. So as we go through our, our reviews, uh, Bruce has been clear, they have a limit at 10 to the minus 5. They have a target of 10 to the minus 6, which, which would be the modern uh, expectation for, for a new plant. But if we're going to be looking at those, we have to also include the improvements that Bruce is putting down if we want to then look at, at, the, at the numbers they have. So the numbers that uh, um, um, uh, Greenpeace keeps coming, coming back to are the numbers without those improvements. If we put those improvements in place, we get an order of magnitude type uh, uh, lowering of, of the risks. So even without that, the... the as we, as we look at more and more details around less and less probable events, so lower, lower risk frequencies, uh, we, of course, are learning more about them and learning about uh, where improvements can be made. So the plants are trending in the right direction. The plants are getting safer and safer, not as, as is being point, uh, uh, tried to be put forward here by, by Greenpeace, that they're, that they're less safe than before. They're, in fact, getting more safe. Dr. McDale. Thank you. I have uh, two questions, but I'll split them in case my colleagues want to go around. Uh, I would like to talk about the uh, suggestion by the intervener on page 9 of H22A, that there is a two-tiered approach to safety in Ontario, I think. We need to address that and staff and uh, Bruce, please. Sort of the middle of, of page nine. Uh, Ken Lafner, for the record, um, we're struggling to find the exact reference, but um, in terms of approach to safety, I think uh, staff has uh, discussed it many times. Uh, the original design, um, licensing basis for these plants was a very conservative, conservative design and defense in depth. Safety is much broader than the risk estimates that the PSAs, the numbers crunch out when we discuss numbers in the 10 to the minus 6, 7, 8. These are just estimates. The limits are all met for the existing plants and they're improving towards the targets. And they, the Bruce plant almost meets the targets. In terms of what how we look at safety, we look at it much broader. We look at defense in depth, barriers, we look at things like operator training, we make sure operators follow procedures, we look at the management of the facility, we look at problem identification corrective action, we look at OPEX, make sure the plants are learning from experience, we look at monitoring both internally, we look at the maintenance program, we look at the aging management program, we look at their outages to make sure that everything that they assume in all their various analysis is in place and is verified physically. We look at their environmental pro, um, monitoring program. We independently have an environmental monitoring program. So when we talk about safety and why we are confident we can make recommendations to the Commission that these plants are safer based upon all that information that we gather across multiple safety and control areas. In terms of the two-tiered, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Jerry Frappe to comment on that. It all goes back to we're following... Uh, the international recommendations. Jerry, Jerry Frappi, for the record. Um, so on, on this uh, particular uh, set of paragraphs where I think uh, the uh, intervener is pointing out that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the policy is that if you are uh, 10 to the minus 5 is, is the limit, as, as we were just talking about, 10 to the minus 6 is a target. If you find yourself in between it, the expectation is that you're going to be looking at uh, improvements. That is the same from the, from the regulator's perspective, whether it be OPG or whether it be Bruce or whether it be New Brunswick Power. So the, the, uh, to say there's a two-tier approach is, is uh, incorrect. Uh, the regulator's expectations are the same. What I think he's making reference to is that OPG is very explicit, that they have a, uh, a policy 
uh, internal policy to OPG, which states that's what they're going to be doing. Uh, Bruce, although they act that way, they do not have a policy uh, statement uh, uh, of, of that nature, uh, and Bruce can perhaps comment on, on, on that. Can we be, look, you guys, this is not a complicated question. Is, is that a policy? Is it a regulatory requirement when you find yourself between limit and target, there should be an action plan? If the answer is yes, then where is it? If the answer is no, then how do you monitor the fact that you go between limit to target? So, Jerry Frappi, for the record. So, to be clear, the requirement is to meet the 10 to the minus 5. There is not a requirement by, from the regulator to, to, uh, to do uh, 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 something if you're between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to so the minus 6. This, so, how, all this how, discussion we had on Darlington and all this, uh, you know, between this and target does not apply to Bruce? Still applies. There's still an expectation, uh, which is different than saying there's a requirement. So we're going to be certainly pushing them and looking to see uh, how can they achieve that uh, 10 to the minus 6 target, as Mr. Jamal has just said, especially as they go through uh, a refurbishment. The difference is that OPG has a stated policy along those lines, whereas Bruce does not. The so, requirements from the regulator are the same. So in view of this discussion, are you going to develop a policy on this? Or you expect us to sort of, uh, every time we see you, to ask? No, I, th I think we need to understand uh, what this is, right? In, in the nuclear business, there's always limits, and, and, and that's fine, and, and we meet the limits. But nobody wants to operate at the limit because then every time you have a problem or something goes wrong, you're below the limit, and, that, that, and that's not fair. So uh, you establish a target that says, I want to be up here. And every time you're not at the target, and it is our policy actually to evaluate it and determine whether there's things that you can do to move you towards the target in a reasonable way. Uh, certainly you want to stay away from the limit. But if you're going to turn the target into a requirement, then you might as well make it the limit, right? Because there's no point then in having a target, and then we'd have another target, and then we'd have another discussion about whether that should be the limit. Um, so to me, this is kind of much ado about nothing. Everybody tries to operate uh, well above the limit. You try to get as close to the target as you can, and indeed, in most cases, we're exceeding the target. Um, and a good example is on Bruce A. Mr. Stencil pointed out that our analysis did detect that there's a there is a, a higher potential for a, a containment bypass on, on three of the Bruce A units because the isolating valve on the, uh, on the shield tank uh, system is manual versus automatic. Uh, we had identified that already in our letter to uh, CNSC uh, committed to actually fix that and the design process is already underway. So when you see that and you see that there's a fix that's doable, then you go ahead and you do the fix, right? Uh, and that's always been our process, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking PSA or you're talking engineering decisions in the plant, uh, equipment failures, whatever. I mean, the, the, the emergency power generators at Bruce B, another example, uh, the generators are getting old, their reliability was declining, so we decided to add a third uh, EPG to bring that reliability back up. That's not an absolute regulatory requirement, but it provides us an opportunity to do things. So uh, our policy is not different than OPG's. It's stated perhaps a little bit differently. Um, and uh, But I think you'll look, if you look, our actions and OPG's actions are very similar on this. There's, there's really no, there's no misunderstanding as far as we're concerned about what goes on here. Yeah. Dr. McDill? I'll ask Mr. Stencil to reply since he's got his hand up. But I did. Yeah, just to, to clarify, I think this is where the Commission could make things easier in the future by in your record of decision state that the same policy as OPG should be referenced in Bruce Powers license control handbook because that's what the actual issue is. Uh, Mr. Saunders said at the first hearing that they have a policy but it's different. It's not licensed, it's not referenced, there are no license uh, references for probabilistic risk assessment um, limits and goals in their LCH when I looked. Uh, but there is an OPG. And remember what happened at the Pickering hearings, which was I pointed out that Bruce, pa uh, Bruce Power, OPG had a policy that's referenced in the LCH, but neither staff uh, nor OPG had informed the commission that there should be an action plan. That's really what happened. So it's important to have these things written down in one place. And as someone from the public, it would be good to see some consistency between plants. Um, I asked... Um, well, Mr. Saunders saying and staff are saying the same rule applies, just make it, reference it in the LCH. Uh, I asked some questions before the hearing about Bruce Powers' uh, risk policy. They um, provided some, but said the rest was proprietary. 
um, but there was no references to action plans that I saw in that. And then at yesterday's hearing, or on Monday's hearing, they also brought up an IAEA document from 1999 that I've never heard of that wasn't referenced in their LCH. The importance, as pointed out by uh, S-294, is when it's referenced in the LCH, it becomes a bounding uh, factor for operation of what defines safe, and if it's not in there, it's not a criteria. So in that way, it is self-regulation at the moment, but you can address that. Mr. Gemma, for the record, uh, there is no way we're going to let Bruce Power to self-regulate. Let me go on the record with respect to, to this uh, comment here. Uh, the key point here is we're, we're dissecting clinical regulatory jargon, regulatory requirement versus a policy and so on and so forth. I want to make it very clear to the Commission that once Bruce Power or any applicant provide us with information in support of the license application, as we, ever, at every hearing, we are proposing a uh, license and an LCH. Post the hearing, we will amend the LCH with respect to, ref uh, to reflect the consistency that is being presented by Mr. Stencil in our LCH because a target is a target with respect to what the licensee has submitted in support of the application. So we can, we can clinically debate the definition of regulatory requirement versus regulatory oversight. Our regulatory oversight is going to be consistent right across the board. So if Bruce Power submitted information in support of the application, we will hold them as in our regulatory oversight regardless of their policy or not. I just want to make that one clear. Okay, thank you. Moving to other issue, Dr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in, on page 11 and 12 um, of 2A, um, talking about emergency mitigation equipment, um, you have a couple of paragraphs in there, the bottom of page 11 and top of page 12, <coughs> where you are, I mean, there are a couple of things that struck me about your writing and the way you wrote it. Um, the first is you are very skeptical of the ability of an EME to achieve the goals that it is setting and the goals that it is credited with in the PSA. Um, you also make a statement that sort of is a little bit like having your cake and eating it. Um, you make a statement that you're surprised that the staff have managed to develop um, a process within two years. If they hadn't done it, would you have been coming to the Commission and saying they're too slow, they haven't done it within two years? I, I think there is a risk when you write like that, that, that the public perception can be um, that, that you're trying to make a subliminal point, whereas I think you're simply trying to express concern about the way in which this is being done. So can you, I, I'm not a statistician, explain to me why you believe the EMA that we got in quite some detail in, on day one and, and on Monday evening, why it is not um, actually achieving its purpose? Uh, we, I, very good question, very perceptive eye. Um, no one at the Commission, I think, has commented on my written tone before. Although there Would was you like me to go through the rest <laughs> of the documents? <laughs> although there was lots of opportunity, I think, in the past. Um, the, as I also stated in the section, I'm not opposed, Greenpeace is not opposed to the use of EMEs. Uh, it's more the, the dynamic that we've seen since the Pickering hearings at, where results have come out very similar to this uh, risk assessment where the large release frequency is near the limit. Um, at first staff didn't tell the commission and then I think at the Pickering hearings there was actually a statement uh, made that we can reduce it by a factor of 10 and I asked for the napkin that that was written on. Um, and then we had another hearing. The, from the outside, the perception is everything's being taken quickly so that you can reduce the risk. Um, so in that way, yes, I am skeptical, and it's because of what's going on elsewhere. So on site-wide risk, for example, seemingly it's going to take a long, long time. There just seems to be, a, uh, and similarly, as I mentioned uh, for Commissioner Velshi's question, with external events, uh, it's taken 10 years to include, include those in PSAs. And when you ask about it, it's like, well, they're really complex. We don't know how to deal with the uncertainties. We've never done this kind of modeling before. There's no international precedence. But with EMEs, it appears very, very easy. So 
I feel, and I said that in my presentation, if you're going to include EMEs in this, in, in your decision, I would also encourage you to factor in um, the different levels of efficiency that staff were discussing internally. So they were looking at 50% and 90%. I haven't seen that mentioned publicly outside of that. And I would also encourage you to be balanced in risk contributors um, to consider the site-wide risk implications moving forward. That may need more um, oversight over the next few years. Uh, I think, actually, while you're on it, the question you asked on Monday to the Saugeen um, scientist, I think, is quite appropriate in this case. You said, so we're aware that science is changing and the methodologies will be different in two years. How, what do you recommend moving forward on how do we address that? Because we know the standard will change in two years. I think we're in a similar situation here, but no one's really um, expressed it in a balanced way. You're going to be looking at EMEs to be included, and I think their application does need more scrutiny. Uh, it'd be good to have international peer review where that's at. Um, and secondly, the site-wide risk component is significant, um, as I showed in my slides, uh, and is not factored in right now to what is considered reasonable risk, but is probably over the limit. So. There was S-294 in 2005 that was applied. It's taken us 10 years to get there. And we're going to be going through another period where other risk contributors and reduction factors will be factored in. I think the commission needs to be, um, have a lot of adult supervision over that process, I think is what I'm saying. Because I view um, the use of EMEs, just the rush, the dynamic, um, seems to be, again, a sh sharpening the pencil exercise in my view. I don't know if that answered it, but... So, okay, I may come back to you, sir, English. Okay. Sir, Mr. Jamal, for the record, <laughs> uh, with respect to Mr. Stencil's comments of the adult supervision of the Commission, uh, the Commission has put timelines and deadlines against the staff with respect to the whole site-wide methodology. It is on the record. We had a special public discussion and public meeting with the Commission. By December 2015, uh, the Commission directed staff to establish methodology with respect to the site-wide PSA. Now, uh, I commend Mr. Stencil on his communication <coughs> skills to take on the site-wide challenge that the whole world is facing and rendering it as an incomplete submission or, or an oversight by CNSC staff. CNSC staff uh, carried out a workshop, an international workshop, on the PSA itself with respect specifically invited experts from around the world in, in Ottawa to address and look at the challenges of the site-wide PSA. So we had a, an ex-US NRC commissioner uh, who is the, the uh, uh, world expert with respect to the PSA and we are leading the world with respect to the site-wide PSA. As we discussed yesterday between a regulatory research, a research and regulatory decision till we get the facts and ha establish in place a solid regulatory framework for us to render a regulatory decision and make it regulatory requirement, the research will continue. So from the supervision of the commission and the direction of the commission is respected by December 2015, and we, are, we will be updating you with respect to the progress on the uh, PSA site-wide methodology. With respect to the other elements that's been raised by Mr. Stencil between 50%, 90% EMEs, as I, as I said it before, I'm going to say it again. Uh, he calls it on a napkin calculation or back of the envelope calculation. We did an estimation to the best of our knowledge with respect to the EMEs. However, as time went on, the uh, EPR, EPRI, uh, I need help now with the uh, Electrical Power Research Institute has, uh, sorry, just my age here, uh, uh, has established and put in place the uh, indices or the values to be used with EMEs in the PSA. And that's why you will see the refinement that was predicted by staff on an estimation to the existing uh, methodology where EME's values are used in the PSA in a much more accurate form. 
Okay, um, I'd, I'd like to move uh, to something, uh, to many other issues uh, that uh, was raised here. Uh, a couple of them, a, a quick reply. Did we, did F3 or tornado been simulated anywhere? For the record, is yes. I'll pass it on to Mr. Frappier to expand. Well, Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, in fact, uh, I would say we did, we did more than that, actually. We did sensitivity analysis beyond the actual uh, tornado analysis. Uh, our, our primary analysis was up to 227 kilometers per hour, and we did sensitivity analysis out to 280 uh, kilometers per hour to look uh, to determine whether there was any, you know, any sort of cliff edge effect or something that, that would be there. Uh, and that was all in the submission. Um, my next uh, kind of a quick question, and this is really important, I think. I mean, the PSA is all very interesting. The question is, can you have a severe accident within 24 hours? I think that uh, if uh, this commission learned anything from Fukushima was we were um, very concerned about shutting down the machine no matter what happened. And I think that's where the result of all the EME was imposed, about uh, water makeup, uh, hookup makeup, uh, all the fire, et cetera, et cetera. How to calculate its impact on a PSA, it's a different issue. But my question is, with all the EME and everything else, can you have a severe accident within 24 hours? Well, he said yes. I'm looking at uh, both of you guys. Well. It's, Frank Saunders, for the record, uh, I mean, the answer is it's never zero, right? Uh, however, if you look at the two large early release frequencies that Mr. Stansel referenced, you'll see that they're at 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 7 territory. Typically, we would consider those incredible. Uh, uh, and so, I, so to interrupt you, but I remember that uh, the industry and staff saying that nothing will happen with, uh, within, um, you know, there's enough water in the core and all the mitigation that we have two and a half days, if I give or take. Is that assumption still correct? The, the assumption that we have lots of reserve and lots of uh, capacity to deal with the events and, and, and that, it, you know, for sure it shouldn't happen in 24 hours, but depends on how big an event you're concerned. We've kind of gone from probable events to plausible events in our whole analysis. But it's been a major change in the way we look at external events, right? So, so for example, if somebody, you know, if, if, uh, if we have a meteorite come down and smash into the station, will you have an event in, in less than 24 hours? Well, probably you will because it'll, it'll, it'll probably clear half the countryside. So, um, you know, so it really depends on what you want to think the events are. Certainly, uh, none of the normal events that we analyze and those expectations will happen in 24 hours are more likely to be out at 72 in those, in those territories. Is there some probability that you can get an early release with the right kind of failures? The, the answer will always be yes to that. Uh, the, the issue is you've got to keep that probability very small, and which we do. Uh, uh, I, I don't think anyone can tell you that that's zero, absolutely zero, because it, you, you can't give you that answer. I wasn't talking about a meteor. I was talking about <laughs> is there enough water in there for some uh, normal kind of uh, some sort of credible accident, however we define do we have enough water uh, makeup uh, in the container and all the EME to make sure that we can actually uh, shut down the machine? Chairman Gemma, for the record, uh, with respect to, I mean, we can show you a, a, uh, a demonstration of the slide. So the key question here is, are you saying, do you, in the case of no human being is available, nothing to be done, uh, can, will there be a, le a release uh, before 24 hours? The answer is no. But then if you put the EME elements with respect to, you start to mitigate the progression of the accident itself. As we spoke during the Fukushima uh, hearing and the CMD on the action plan itself, when we walked through the progression of the accident scenario, from within design basis to the beyond design basis with respect to the depletion of, let me jump into the heat sink within the moderator itself. So the corium melt and the uh, start to put pressure on the containment protection itself, the 24 hours is reasonable. And, but again, this is without any medication, no human is available, nothing's being done. 
once you start to stop the progression of the accident through the EMEs, you can go, if you hook up to the steam generators, as we demonstrated in the Fukushima Action Plan, you can go on uh, cooling forever without any releases. And in Fukushima itself, in Fukushima itself, the releases that did take place were beyond 24 hours. So we have very good confidence that the 24 hours will be sustained. I will pass it on to Mr. Frappi if he's got anything else to add. Uh, Jerry Frappi for the record. So I guess the way you ask the question is, 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 is uh, the sort of thing that makes technical people and public relations people two, two sorts of different people. Um, and all the accidents that, uh, that we've been looking at, and certainly the, the major one that, uh, that, uh, that is potentially credible, which is the, uh, the loss of off-site power, the loss of power, how that's going to progress, uh, then uh, clearly the, there will be no releases within, uh, within the 24-hour period. If you ask the question, is there anything we could dream up that would, would, would uh, allow that to happen, uh, then you're into... Uh, as Mr. Saunders said, you know, asteroid hits, things like that. They keep, the, and they would result in, in, in releases faster than, than 24 hours. The question is, is that, or is that uh, what's the level of safety that is acceptable here? What's the level of risk that's acceptable? So if you look at anything that's going to result in releases faster than 24 hours, we would consider them not credible, even in our discussions of beyond design-based accidents, even in our view now post-Fukushima of, of uh, having to really look at small, uh, small, smaller probability accidents, they would still be below that level that we would consider uh, plausible. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for asking this question, President Binder. It's a really important one. Um, and to start off, I'd like to point out that I wouldn't have been able to identify this as an issue uh, unless I was able to ask questions of Bruce Power for additional information, because these numbers were buried within the overall large release frequency. Um, so thank you to Bruce Power for doing that, and it's something we should continue. I would encourage you to look at table six in my submission, uh, where it takes out the large early releases uh, from Bruce Power's risk assessment. Um, and before EMEs, what you find is that large early releases are 97.47% of the large release frequency. So that's significant. This isn't about asteroids. Um, this is about the findings of their risk study. And as I mentioned, these risk studies were used in the 1990s to define off-site emergency plans. So we should heed what this says. After that, they added EMEs. And this goes to... Um, Commissioner McEwen's question, I don't have the background to understand this, but I'm a little skeptical about how EMEs within the first 24 hours would be able to reduce this. But people can explain that to me. I'm open to it, but it seems a little rushed. That said, so that gets it down to 1E e to the 6. If you then look at the table um, on page 15 of Bruce Power's public uh, probabilistic risk assessment, you see there that for Bruce A, they've managed to reduce the internal events, uh, large release frequency, down to 1.397, e to the 7. So what they've effectively done there, through some future modifications and analytical enhancements, is they've reduced that large release frequency that was dominated by two early release scenarios through a lot of pencil sharpening. And this gets to the heart of my question, or my concern, is I think this needs more scrutiny before we move forward. Um, earlier it was said about being practically eliminated is, is the new catchword instead of uh, credible. When you look at the CNSC's definition of how that should be evaluated, it's flexible, uh, but it states that it should begin with design changes and not analytical enhancements, or analytical enhancements should be secondary to changes in design. Um, this scenario here, I think, needs um, a lot more scrutiny moving forward about what was done, what could be done, uh, because you're seeing a great deal of uncertainty here with something that has a great threat to the public. That's two levels of magnitude difference. Um, this is why, again, I'm suggesting before the refurbishment takes place, it would be good to review these scenarios and look at design changes to containment 
that could actually add in design changes to eliminate this as opposed to just analytical enhancements. So thank you for the question. It is a very important issue. Okay. Anybody else? Ms. Velshi. Um, before we let go of uh, the early release, because I saw on slide 17 of your presentation of Monday night, uh, that even with uh, the EME credit, uh, the early release still accounted for more than 90% of the large release frequency. Uh, and I too was trying to reconcile that with the consequences of severe accident where we didn't think that 24 hours. So I think it may be just too little information and me reading more into it, but if the early releases do make up such a large component of the large release frequency scenarios, why isn't that the more likely scenario for large release frequencies. I'm not quite sure I've, I've heard the answer to that. From Gemma, for the record, I'll pass it on to Mr. Jerry Frappi, but we discussed the definition of early release where it should have been the submission of all the releases, but Jerry Frappi, over to you. Uh, thank you, um, Jerry Frappi, for the record. S so I don't dispute the, the, uh, the number crunching, if you like, but it's the meaning of it that we have to really sit back and think about for a second. We're talking about the other release categories having been sort of eliminated, if you like. They're under control. They're not going to happen. And now we're left over with what, what, what's left, if you like. And we all agree, and I think everybody's putting out, it's a very, very, very small probability. So that's the first thing to talk about. Then within that very, very small probability, uh, what are the releases that could, could occur uh, are, of course, the, the ones that uh, the, uh, the analysis would show are, are not likely to happen. The other ones have been accounted for and uh, will prevent the, the release. So it's not surprising that the small residual risk that's left is in fact mostly into, into these, this category. The point is that, that, that has to be made here though is that we're talking about a couple of orders magnitude smaller than what we consider the, 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 the limit of, uh, of probabilities that need to be considered. Uh, fair enough, but I thought when we were doing the severe accident assessment, uh, it wasn't so much that is this likely to happen, it's saying just, it's a given, it's going to happen, uh, what's going to be the off-site uh, uh, response required and the impact, and, uh, and t Given that, it seems like the early release is probably the most likely scenario if we are going to have a large release. Isn't that correct? Mr. So Jim, for the record, if I can understand you correctly, when we did the SARP study that showed the 10 to the 14 release, which is the uh, equi equivalent in uh, radiological impact as Fukushima itself, uh, those uh, this was more or less taking the worst case scenario and the doomsday scenario uh, with respect to the releases. If I understand your question correctly, and please correct me if I'm not giving you the right answer, but in order to look at containment protection, there'll be some minor re controlled releases. Uh, those controlled releases are controlled releases with the enhancement of the Fukushima uh, safety elements, such as filtered venting, so the radiological impact has been decreased quite a bit. So if I'm not answering your question, please let me know. I mean, we did the worst case scenario being 10 to the 14 with respect to the radiological impact as it was in Fukushima in order to demonstrate and, and, and establish in place the emergency plans and look at the radiological risk associated with such uh, release. Um, I don't know if you're not answering my question. I, I'm just not sure what my question is. So if, it, well, if the release category is an RC0 or RC2, um, so if it's um, take RC2, that shows that it's an early release within 24 hours. And so my question then is that, you know, that's got the greater than 10 to the 14 Becquerel of cesium-137 and so on. Isn't that the scenario for the severe accident analysis? I'll have to consult with my colleagues and come back to you on this. I, I, what you're asking, I think, is that the scenario that you used in the Darlington uh, analysis around that? And the answer is yes, that was the scenario that was used. So is that not an early release, though? 
Yes, it is. And, the, and within twenty four hours, if you, if you recall, uh, Darlington scenario had three different versions of a release within twenty four hours, and and so forth, right? So that was the scenario that they used in the Darlington uh, assessment. Yes. Barclay Houghton speaking. Just to correct for the SARP study, so the the the, um, the assumption was to come up with a release that um, could be shown to uh, potentially challenge the offsite uh, protective actions and the potential health consequences. That's what the purpose of the study was. But in doing that study, uh, in choosing the uh, 10 to the 14 release of uh, cesium-137, we needed to be satisfied that that was uh, a reasonable assumption and that wasn't an under-assumption. And so we went through that process and came to the conclusion that the 24-hour release uh, was reasonable. Our view was that the release would probably occur after 24 hours, but we deterministically said, okay, it's going to happen at the 24-hour mark, and away it goes. And then we gave three scenarios, one with the one-hour release, and then a 24-hour release and a 72-hour release. So the focus was on the consequences, but we were satisfied that the, if you wanted to work it back to the accident, that it was a reasonable accident and that 24 hours would be um, a good assumption. We then compared um, to the real life of Fukushima with the three units that went at 23, 43, and something like 73 hours, uh, which was appropriate. And then we also, because we did very conservative estimates on the um, releases that actually went out, um, they actually, the doses actually compared to the actual doses of Fukushima. So that was another good check in that it was a, a good um, uh, study of the system, but we still treat it as a hypothetical event because the focus was more on the consequences than on the accident itself. Uh, any, um, anybody else have other issues? I think we can go on this particular topic uh, forever. We're not going to uh, get any further than this. Any other clarification? Yes, no? Last chance? I have uh, and it's only because it was one of the weaknesses you identified was that there wasn't adequate guidance around assessment of external hazards. I think that was one that we haven't spoken about. Um, so I'll ask Bruce Power first whether you agree with that statement, and then staff can have the last word on uh, adequacy of guidance. Uh, Gary Newman, for the record, uh, we believe there's adequate guidance there, and and if we are unsure, we we do seek uh, uh, external uh, input. One of the reasons why we uh, we enlisted the the support from international um, uh, PRA experts was to make sure that what we were doing uh, was being done correctly and to the highest standard. Thank you. Staff, would you know why the intervener thinks there, hasn't, there isn't adequate guidance? Jer Jerry Frappi, for the record. Uh, well, he, he'll have to answer for himself as to why he thinks it. But um, at this point in time, I think we have a clear, we have uh, some pretty good clarity around the, the requirements. Um, I think that uh, where there's still lots of discussion happening is around things like methodologies. Both here and internationally, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, research going on into uh, better understanding of these very rare events that, uh, that the, the Mother Earth might, uh, might throw at us. Uh, so in that sense, there's certainly lots of discussions going on. There's uh, several research projects going on, international groups that are looking at how we can do it better. Uh, but I believe that as far as for today, for the submission of a PSA, whether it be OPG, New Brunswick Power, or Bruce, uh, we, have, uh, some, we have both consistent and enough guidelines. But I, I would not say that the, the, those will not change over the next three, four years, because there is a lot of activity going on internationally in this. And I'll turn it over to you and saying why you think there isn't adequate guidance. Um, well, as we've seen from the Pickering hearings to now, this has been a debate at each hearing. Whether to include high winds, for example, was a big issue at the Pickering hearings. I also raised it um, uh, in this forum because there's no uh, level two PRA for high winds. It's difficult from an outsider to discern why. Um, we've heard lots about methodologies and going to staff. I've never seen them clarify it on paper, um, which might help clarify things. Uh, 
for example, because that way you can then dig into uh, assumptions and where they're coming. For example, uh, how are staff summing CDF frequency versus LRF frequency? If they would actually put that in one place, an intervener or the public could then judge whether it's been followed through on. I can't do that at the moment. Uh, another one that's an issue related to the Godridge tornado is there's the exclusion of external events uh, over 10,000 years. Um, I've tried to look, but I've never been able to find any uh, examples of where other regulators or utilities internationally use that cutoff. So there's examples like that that I think need to be clarified because the when I've been saying that there's a industry red regulation, it's very difficult with the CNSC for an outsider to judge whether a rule has been met or not. And when we do, for example, uh, the numbers that I showed you here today, there's a whole lot of discussion of other things. Um, it would help more to have clear criteria on this. And this again is related to EMEs. It's been 10 years since the commitment was made to include external events for existing reactors. And yet we're still here talking about how to do it. There was never, they knew these deadlines were coming. Fukushima was now four years ago. And we're still using this hodgepodge of rules that could be inconsistent between stations. So I think from a, a consistency perspective, I think the commission could help the situation by giving some directive, directives for consistency and transparency on the methodologies as they're uh, confirmed, let's say. Because right now, from the outside, it's really difficult to actually pick into this stuff. Um, so I hope that answers your question. So I'm, I'm really disappointed to hear this because uh, I think uh, the Commission had been trying to come up with a new set of uh, regulatory documents and uh, I thought at that time um, any vagueness on methodology, et cetera, would, you know, would be highlighted by you or anybody who has a particular concern with them. Because um, not only they put in regulation, they're putting also guidance on this. So, and now with all the material that uh, we saw on PSA, both in Pickering and here, are you still saying that there's some unknowns on methodology and, and approach? Because if they are, then we should identify them and, and try to, we, we try to disseminate information to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you're putting a lot on my shoulders because I guess you're expecting me to comment on every guide. Um, but fair enough. Yes. <laughs> if, you're, if you're gonna come and then beat us up on that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I think what, you know, everyone has attended the Pickering and now these hearings. And at both of those hearings, there was a lot of back and forth about how you sum. Do you use simple summation? Do you use all these other factors? I know management committee in January 2014 had a meeting about how to sum and a discussion on what those policies are going forward. That's where the policy for external events was also discussed but not released. So there is an issue with when we're getting into the details of how that is done that I haven't seen in guidance yet. I'm happy if it's pointed out to me, but I, for example, how do you sum CDF? What is the accepted methodology for summing CDF versus LRF? Has that been done in this license application? Um, I'm not able to measure that at present. Staff, any uh, comment on that? J Jerry Frappi, for the record. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a difference between um, uh, Mr. Stenso or a member of the public not seeing exactly how things are done versus that that means it's inconsistent. So I think that for practitioners, there's, there, there's, not, there's not that question mark, although it is deep and dark analysis and maybe we should be doing a lot more work to make it much more clearer to, to people. So for instance, he mentioned about the, uh, the, the, the wind and the, the high wind not being in the level two. So one of the things that we do is we look at the level one and the wind is in the level one. So the high wind conditions, the, 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 as we mentioned, the tornado is much larger even than, than what was in Godridge is considered. But they can look at that incident is actually what we call bounded by another incident. So another, another hazard is actually going to be much worse 
than, than what that one is going to be. And if they can demonstrate that to our satisfaction, then they don't need to pursue that analysis in level two for the wind because the analysis on seismic is much more difficult for, for them to meet anyways, and so it will ensure that they're covered for, uh, for wind or, or whatever the case may be. So things like that are known by practitioners but perhaps are not as, as clear to, 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 to members of the public, both in the theory of how the thing works uh, but also perhaps in the execution for a particular uh, case like, 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 like the Bruce case. But we're into, like, it's going to take a, a lot of Mr. Stencil's time to, to, to go through all of these things, and at a certain point you have to rely on that there are practitioners who, who have methods. On the second part, with respect to additional guidance, we are looking at, at uh, uh, improving the reg doc so that there is a bit more visibility uh, to the public. We have a reg doc, uh, as you know. We're, we're making reference to S-294. It's now been replaced by 2.4.2, 2. 2. thank you. Uh, 242 uh, itself <coughs> is now also being looked at as to whether we should add more guidance to it uh, or not. But that would be something we would do as a normal practice of improving reg framework and would not be expected within the next couple of years or so. Okay, thank you. You have the final word. Um, quickly in response, whenever you hear the word bounding, I think that's where you're going to get into disagreements with interveners on what is the justification for that bounding. Um, I just raised the issue about why one in 10,000 years for external events. I've seen no evidence that that's done by other utilities outside of Canada. So these are questions and legitimate questions that probe into the why. So I'd just like to flag that for trying to uh, communicate with interveners. For the last word, um, I'm recommending that you do a shorter license so that this safety case for the Bruce life extension can be publicly reviewed by both the commission and the public. And the reason for it is, as I pointed out today, there's a lot of questions and uncertainty related to the risk assessments uh, provided by Bruce Power. Those risk assessments will then be used to determine safety upgrades for the plant. That shouldn't be done behind closed doors. The most appropriate place for doing that is within a licensing hearing. Uh, there, OPG later this year at their license renewal will present their plans, uh, but we don't have them at these hearings. So in the past, we used to do license renewal hearings every few years. I don't think it's an over-the-top ask to um, request that there be such a hearing where all of these different issues can be discussed so that we're sure that you have sufficient information for making really important decisions on safety upgrades. Right now, uh, as I noted, staff have never stated whether they've finished the review and what the results were of the PSA. I don't think you have sufficient evidence for making those decisions. So my hope is that we will have that sufficient evidence in a few years. Thank you very much. Thank you.